So Thank you and good afternoon, Sioux Falls City Council. I think perhaps some of you had, might have seen the uh, article about the Brandon City Council goes paperless, uh, which I just wanted to mention to some of you who haven't. Um, but the City of Sioux Falls, as you know, have donated our used laptops to the City of Brandon. So it was fun to see um, Brandon get a great story out of that. And for those who aren't aware, uh, uh, there are state statutes in place which uh, don't allow us to gift those to just anybody. They must be to another type of governmental agency. The school uh, districts would be one of those that would be acceptable to give it to along with the municipalities. And so that's what the city council did a while ago. And tonight's agenda, if I may just get right into um, some issues of tonight's we can just walk through it. We have this Mayor Munson's update If you have at your desk. You take a look at that. We'll kind of walk through some changes. There will be some um, requests to amend the regular agenda, uh, moving item number 29 up um, after public input. There will be guests as a part of that donation, and so as a courtesy to them, there's a request by the Parks Department to move that forward, if you will. And then, of course, uh, for the citizens' input, uh, we will not be asking for their home address, whether just or not they are a resident, and to state their name. And then on to the regular agenda on item number 17, it's a second reading. There will need to be a substitute motion to amend uh, the ordinance to adopt, and there's some language there below that, if you could read that tonight. Or you can ask the person who's clerking the meeting tonight, I believe that'll be Tamara Jorgensen. She can read that on your behalf, but you must request her to do that, and she can, she can walk you through those ver verbiage of changes. Um, I believe that item has come through fiscal committee meeting, so uh, as you know, there is um, no changes there other than just adding parts of the ordinance that were left out when it was calendared uh, at first reading. Item number 19 is another second reading. There will need to be some amendments to that as well. You can see the language proposed on the back side of this uh, little memo. and. Um, uh, also, again, you can ask Tamara to read those for you into the record, and then you can just go ahead and vote on that. Uh, there are no uh, objections to the amendment. It's just simply finishing up some of the arrangements that needed to be done ahead of time. And I believe there were some state statutes that were in the ordinance that weren't correct, so they're having to re-amend or amend those with the proper uh, state re law references in it. Item number 27 would be the East Side Sanitary Sewer System. As you know, this has been deferred a few times and has been worked on very hard by the a number of people over the administration. And there's some amendments regarding that. Uh, I believe everything is um, pretty much straightforward for those of you who attended the IRAB meeting a few weeks ago are aware of those changes and it seems to be satisfactory to the whole. It's just uh, just cleaning up some language and some changes there that uh, were part of those uh, public hearings. And then finally item number 28, another amendment, if you will, the language is there. Uh, for you, and it would be simply changing out some language in the ordinance as well. And then lastly, for item number 27 on the back of this page, you can just simply look at, there was a typographical error uh, in terms, or transposition, pardon me, in a, in a number, and so uh, Tamara just copied that so you would see that in its writing and context for you. Otherwise, that is everything. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Questions of Deborah? Very good. Moving on to the next item. I don't see anybody here from the mayor's office for comment. Uh, item number four is the audit committee. Uh, no report, but we'll be hearing uh, from Rich later today. Very good. Thank you, Pat. Uh, fiscal committee. Uh, no report. Very good. Thank you, Gerald. Land use committee. No report. Thank you. Public services committee. No report. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, now. Part number eight is the City Council open discussion. Are there any items? Well, I can't believe it. So we're going to move on to our presentations. And I think that's the first time since I've been here in three years we've not had uh, comments on the open discussion here. Uh, number nine for our presentations, the first one is going to be our comprehensive annual financial report review by Rich Oaksall, the lead internal auditor. Rich. Good afternoon, City Council. Um, we have a fairly long report for you to, uh, to look at. Uh, we'll try to make this presentation brief and understand we have several uh, items on the agenda to cover. Um, when we talk about the CAF or what we're referring to is that comprehensive annual financial report, which is that uh, very um, 
uh, long report that comes out once a year that Ide Bailey presents that in the spring after the audit is done, and it's over 100 pages. Uh, there's a lot of good information in there, a lot of statistical information, uh, financial information, but sometimes it can be a little overwhelming. Um, and uh, so the, the point of this uh, is that uh, we want to uh, take some of the mystery out of that, that CAFR and look at it from uh, maybe a fresh perspective. The organization of this report is, uh, we'll, we'll talk very briefly about the audit expectation gap, what external auditors do and what they don't do. Uh, then we'll get into that CAFR review, we'll get into those financial indicators, and then we'll have a brief uh, comment on the price of government. So we're kind of following the, uh, the, uh, the, the written report. Uh, we're not going to go into the detail that uh, is in the written report. Um, at the end of this, obviously, we'll take questions that, uh, that you might have about the report. The overall objective was to promote discussion about the city's financial condition and alert the council to trends uh, either in favorable or unfavorable in the city's finances. And uh, as for the methodology, we compared Sioux Falls to 10 peer communities in the Midwest. Uh, we performed trend analysis for the last five years, uh, for about 2004 to 2008, based on the information in the CAFR. And when uh, where it was appropriate, we adjusted dollars for the impact of inflation. The 10 peer communities that we used were uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Duluth, Minnesota, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, uh, Fargo, uh, Green Bay, La Crosse, Wisconsin, Racine, Wisconsin, St. Cloud, Sioux City, and Topeka, Kansas. First of all, let's talk about briefly about that audit expectation gap and, and what it means to have a, uh, a, a clean audit opinion. That audit expectation gap is, is a term that's uh, ex uh, used to express the difference between what, what external auditors are actually doing and what the public thinks that they're doing. And sometimes that can be a, a rather sizable gap. What does the public often expect the external auditor to do? Uh, test every transaction? accept responsibility for the financial statements, prepare the financial statements, certify the financial statements, detect fraud, guarantee the accuracy of the financial statements, and give early warning of possible business failure. And the reality is that's not what uh, external auditors do. That's, uh, it's, it's, it's an expectation of the public sometimes that they cannot meet. What they're um, hired to, what they actually, uh, do is select, uh, uh, test selected transactions because if they were to test every transaction, the cost of the audit would be prohibitive. Um, financial statements are the responsibility of the management. They're not the responsibility of the auditors. Auditors provide only reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free from material misstatement. And auditors give their professional opinion on the financial statements. They, they don't, they're not guaranteeing or certifying anything. Even though they have that in their title, you know, certified public accountant, <laughs> they're not certifying the financial statements. So what is an unqualified audit opinion? Sometimes it's referred to as a clean opinion. An unqualified opinion means that the financial statements have been prepared using uh, the generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, they do not contain material misstatements and are fairly presented. The auditors, and we're speaking of uh, the CPA firms in this example, are not expressing an opinion on whether or not fraud exists in the organization, whether resources are being used efficiently and eff uh, effectively, and whether the organization is in compliance with all laws and regulations. Um, that's one area where the internal auditors can be, be an assistance. So we can go into that, those kind of things and answer some of those questions. Okay, let's get into the financial indicators. There was 11 indicators in the report. Uh, just in the interest of time, we're going to go through five of those indicators um, and just give you an oversight there. First one is liquidity. That refers to the ability to pay short-term obligations, and the formula is really simple. You take cash and the cash equivalents divided by uh, accounts payable and other current liabilities and the portion of the long-term liabilities that are due within one year. And when we look at Sioux Falls, uh, you can't read the year there, it's, it's in red there. But in 2004, the liquidity ratio was 2.4. In 2005, 3.2. 2006, it was 4.2. 2007, 6.3. And then the last year is 4.9. So the liquidity ratios are good. That means we have a short term solvency. We have the ability to pay our uh, short term obligations. And uh, 
experts consider uh, a ratio of less than one to be a, a warning sign. For example, if it was 0 0.8, that would be a warning sign where your, your assets are uh, uh, less than your, your, your current liabilities. But uh, as you can see, the, uh, the trend is that liquidity ratio has, has been improving in the last five years. Now, an indicator of uh, long-term solvency, ability to pay long-term bills, would, uh, one indicator is long-term debt ratio. And the formula is your total long-term debt divided by your total assets. And uh, the, the higher the ratio, that means you have a, uh, a declining ability to pay your long-term debt. And some analysts that we uh, researched uh, suggested a benchmark of about 0 0.5 as, as a, uh, uh, one that you should not exceed. When we looked at the last five years, we're way below that, that, uh, that threshold of 0 0.5. We're, um, for 2004 through 2006, we were very low. We were about, uh, well, you can see they're about uh, 0 0.07, uh, maybe 0 0.10. 2007 and 2008, obviously, we went up in long-term debt. Uh, but we're still way below that threshold of 0.5, and we're still, uh, in comparison to the 10 peer communities, we're, we're quite a bit below that. But uh, obviously, we did make quite a jump there in 2007, 2008. General fund, unreserved fund balance. The general funds, that primary operating fund of the city, that's where uh, police and fire, libraries, parks, that sort of thing falls under as a general fund. The fund balance is merely the, the difference between the fund assets and the fund liabilities. And uh, unreserved fund balance is often considered reserves or a rainy day fund. And the, the council has a, has a goal of a finishing the year at, at 25%, which we have done for the last uh, five years very easily. You can see the, uh, we've never, I don't think we've gone below 30% there in the last five years. Uh, and last year we were up to about 36%. Uh, you can see where we sit in comparison to the 10 uh, comparison communities, and they were at about 21 uh, percent. So we're looking good there. The, uh, the GFOA recommends anywhere from 5 to 15 percent. Uh, they say that's 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 acceptable. Uh, some of the credit rating agencies uh, figure if you're over 8 percent, you're doing you're doing fine. Uh, when I looked at the uh, those 10 comparison cities, there, there was a tremendous range. There's one city that was at about 1.5 percent. I think that was Duluth, but I'm not sure. And then there was one city that was uh, 50%, but most of them were uh, right about that average, about 20% or so. So we're doing well there. Next indicator is the general fund operating expenditures per capita. This is a commonly used uh, financial indicator. It's the cost. If the cost of providing services is rising faster than your population, that could be a warning sign. It could be an indicator of inefficiency or decreased productivity. And uh, the formula is you take the operating expenditures and constant dollars, which means you adjust for inflation, and then you divide by your population. And by the way, the, the information was easily uh, available in the CAFR, in the statistical section, and in the financial statements. So we look at the general fund operating expenditures per capita adjusted for inflation. It, it's, it's fairly steady, if not a, a slightly downward trend. Uh, 2004, about $577 uh, operating expenditures per person. Um, and last year is about $535. So it's, it's holding steady there. So that's, uh, that could be considered a good sign. Another debt indicator is uh, long-term debt to population. When the long-term debt is, uh, ratio is accelerating, the uh, local government can become overburdened. However, uh, the credit agencies like Standard & Poor and uh, Moody's, uh, they, they also caution that uh, a, a community that's not keeping up with their infrastructure is going to have a, a, a very low ratio. So um, the formula is long-term debt divided by population. And we look at uh, our comparison to the comparison cities. We're, we're quite a bit below the average there. They're at about uh, $2,200 of long-term debt per person. Uh, on the average in those cities. We're at about 1,500. Uh, obviously, you can see a big jump there between 2006 and 2007. Um, when you uh, look at what the credit rating agencies like Standard & Poor uh, consider, we, we went from the low category to the moderate category, so we're, we're not at the, uh, that high threshold yet, but uh, um, you know, it's, it bears watching, obviously. Okay, the, the final part of our report was the, uh, the price of government, which is a, a term and concept that was popularized by uh, 
David Osborne and Peter Hutchinson and a book by the same name. And uh, the formula in the book was taxes plus fees plus charges divided by the community income, which they defined as the uh, population times the per capita income, which you can find in the statistical section of the CAFR. And when we look at the, uh, the price of government for Sioux Falls, expressed in cents per dollar personal income, it's, it's holding very steady, about 3.8 cents per dollar personal income, uh, up to about 4.0 cent, cents. Um, nationally, the cost of local government, uh, city, county, school districts, is about six to six and a half cents per dollar of personal income. Um, depending on how you calculate that, that figure, you could, you could uh, calculate that at about three cents per dollar of personal income. If you included the, the metropolitan statistical area, that would be about 220,000 people. Um, if you use that, and if you use the investment income, you'd come up with about three cents per dollar of personal income. Uh, just all what you want to decide on the formula. Uh, so I thought this was interesting information uh, for the city council. The conclusion, uh, we conclude the financial strength of the city of Sioux Falls is excellent. We compare favorably to the 10 peer communities. Uh, the solvency, both the short term and the long term, is, is strong. Uh, Long-term debt increased in 2007-2008. In However, we're not at the, uh, quite at the warning level at this point. This is based on, obviously, end of the year, 2008. Um, and the price of government has been stable about the last five years. And um, I'm willing to take any questions or comments you have at this time. Questions of Rich. Mr. Brown. Rich, not a question, but I did catch you before him, but I just wanted to thank you publicly. That sometimes it's easy to lose perspective when we're dealing with the, the dollars of city government up here, and, and you've taken it and put it in a very user-friendly format and, and written it very well. Um, I'm just wondering from a council perspective if instead of this being buried in the audit committee notes somewhere, if we can put this out on the website so it's much more accessible for people so when they have questions they can see what our financial performance is. And then th I wanted to lastly thank you for doing the calculations on the price of government. I'm a fan of that book, and uh, I think that really demonstrates what a value taxpayers are getting in Sioux Falls for, for their money. Thank you. Mr. Stegger. Yes. Uh, Rich, I was wondering, um, you know, we're, we're focusing here on the general fund a lot. We have the general fund operating expenditures per capita. Do yes. you have any numbers on, on the per capita for the total budgets for those years? Uh, you mean including the enterprise funds and the CIP? Mm -hmm. We can we can calculate those because we're spending yeah. so much in yeah. the CIP. It's kind of making yeah. you know. Well, the reason uh, and, I, and I put this in the detail in the report. I think um, oftentimes uh, analysts don't include the capital expenditures when they're doing a review of this because sometimes uh, that can distort the uh, the trend analysis because they can vary quite a bit from one year to the sure. next. But, yeah, we can calculate that figure. Because um, at the same time, while it can distort, yes. it's also kind of not indicating to the public the true cost that's taking place uh, each year. And I think the reason they use the operating uh, numbers is because that gives some indication of, of the productivity or efficiency of the workers, uh, or it's, it's one way mm -hmm. to measure that. Uh, but, yes, that, that, those numbers, we can calculate that and provide that to the council. Anybody else? Very good. Seeing none, thank you, Rich, for your okay. report. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, the second item uh, is the Children's Home Society presentation. We have Rick Weber in the audience today. He's the development director. And uh, Rick, if you'd come forward, and welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here and present some information about the, the Children's Home Society. I know. Many of you are familiar with the agency. Um, maybe you might not be that familiar, but what I'd really like to do is just kind of for some general information to share a little bit about our history. You know, just being in this building reminds me of the rich history we have of the Children's Home Society, part of South Dakota and Sioux Falls, and just tell you a little bit about our programs and services and maybe just give you some examples of some of the situations that we deal with at the Children's Home Society. Uh, the first Children's Home Society was actually started in Chicago in 1889, and it was really set up to serve children who were abandoned, neglected, abused, unwanted, uh, unwanted children. And in South Dakota, uh, the Children's Home Society was started in 1893. And it's the oldest nonprofit human service organization in South Dakota. 
And many might know that Children's Home was known as an orphanage for many, many years, for decades. But really the true mission of the Children's Home Society was to provide permanent homes for children. Really that was the, at the core. Uh, and you might recall the stories of the orphan trains back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, you know, it was an interesting concept that, you know, the larger cities to the east were overcrowded with troubled children, un unwanted, abandoned kids. And they would put these kids on, the, on trains and come out to the big open spaces of the west. They'd put up posters. People would come to the train station and pick out kids. And the goal was to find homes for these children. Well, the founders of the Children's Home Society said, you know, there really probably should be a better way to do that, that maybe we should visit the homes, maybe do some sort of a home study. I'm sure in those days it was pretty minor compared to what we do today, but maybe we should get some references. But really that was the start of the Children's Home Society, that we need to honor children and do our best to find homes for kids. And it's interesting that if you look at those who started the Children's Home Society, and there were many great organizations at that time, but they were really true pioneers in the care and advocacy for children. Um, it's interesting that the first case of a child that was removed from their parents due to maltreatment goes back to the 1870s, a legal court case. There was a girl by the name of Mary Ellen, and she was abandoned by her parents. She was living with relatives who were ab abusing her. And there were a group of people that became aware of this, and they wanted to help her. Well, they hired an attorney, and the attorney quickly found, well, there was, no, there was no basis to do this. There were no laws that protected children. But what the attorney did find out, that there were laws to protect animals. And so the attorney went to court on the basis that this child was a form of an animal and convinced the court to remove that child. And I think that speaks a little bit about the history of protecting children is really fairly young in our society, um, but many great things have happened you know, over, over the decades. Uh, the founders of Children's Home Society of South Dakota, Elizabeth and William Sherrard, started the home uh, and out of their own personal home, which was located over by the University of Sioux Falls, and took five children into their home, and that was the start. Then in 1901, a very large granite building was built, and it sat at the corner of 10th and Cliff, where there's a Lewis drugstore now, and for decades, through the 1960s, that was the home of the Children's Home Society. Elizabeth and William Sherrard helped write the first child protection laws in South Dakota. If you ever visit the Capitol, the state Capitol, and go down the hall where the, the governor's office is, you'll see a, a very large kind of a sculptured picture of Elizabeth Sherrard and honoring her for her work in care and advocacy for South Dakota's children. And over the years, hundreds of children were served. Uh, some came, there were family crisis, and those children were able to re return to their parents. Some kids grew up in the orphanage, but hundreds and hundreds of children were placed in adoptive homes. To this day, we still get requests for records from, from people that were adopted or their relatives. Today, we continue that tradition of caring for kids. That's really what we're all about, helping troubled kids. Last year, we served over 2,400 children from across South Dakota, the whole state. We do serve a few kids from other states, primarily southwestern Minnesota. Um, in 1998, uh, the Children's Home Society merged with the Children's Inn. Some might remember that um, happened about 11 years ago. The Children's Inn was started in 1977 as a domestic violence shelter for women and for children. It was, I think, one of the first 20 in the country that were started. So in addition to the children we serve at Children's Inn, we provide emergency shelter and services to over 400 women a year that come in for emergency shelter. And we help hundreds of other women who come for crisis counseling, support groups. We do parenting education, advocacy, and other services, mainly focusing on domestic violence and making sure women are safe. Now, we serve some men, too, but they can't come into the shelter facility itself. We would definitely help make sure that everybody has the opportunity for safety. Uh, you might know Children's Inn is located at 409 Northwestern Avenue here in Sioux Falls. Our Sioux Falls Children's Home is located on a 28-acre campus north of Washington High School. We have a beautiful campus. And at, uh, out in the hills, we have a Black Hills Children's Home that's located about 20 miles southwest of Rapid City near Rockerville. And we have an emergency shelter uh, right in Rapid City. You know, our focus is to work, on, work with younger children. You know, some people, I think, get, there's a lot of agencies with the name children in it. Uh, but we primarily work with younger kids. <laughs> Uh, the majority of our children have a history of physical abuse, sexual abuse, or neglect. 
and are referred by the state child protection services, a part of the Department of Social Services. Now, we do serve other kids who might have really great families, healthy families. The kids just have some sort of emotional problem, behavior problem, and that family needs some help. And we do get referrals from school districts where ch children are just not doing well in school, they're failing, they're having problems, and school districts refer to us also. Um, we don't serve children whose primary needs are physical disabilities or if they have severe developmental disabilities, like severe autism, for example. Uh, we don't serve children who, if their primary problems are drug and alcohol addictions or juvenile delinquency. You know, most of our kids are abused and neglected and have some sort of emotional and behavior problem. Um, our, our programs, we have emergency shelter where children might come for a day or two or a week or two until a safe plan can be developed. We have residential treatment. We have 62 beds out at the Sioux Falls Children's Home and 52 in, in the Black Hills where the kids stay an average of a year. Very intensive treatment. We're accredited like a hospital by the um, Joint Commission on Accreditation of Health Organizations. And we have our own schools. The children are in schools as part of treatment, but we also have 20 to 25 day students in our school who come just for our day school program. And we have forensic interview and exam centers for children when they first talk about being abused. Typically, it's sexual abuse cases. In Sioux Falls, it's called Child's Voice, and it's a partnership with Sanford Health. And we have a facility in Rapid City. And it used to be children would have multiple interviews, child protection, the police department, um, maybe the state's attorney, the defense attorney. Well, these kids were really re-traumatized. Well, now it's one centralized, child-focused interview by someone who's very specialized in this, and it's videotaped. So the child doesn't have to repeat that story over and over, and there's a physical exam and it really helps the child, and it also helps the prosecution of the cases. And statewide, we see about 900 children um, through those forensic um, interview centers. Uh, last year, um, we, we saw about 2,400 children, as I mentioned, about 900 in the forensic interview centers, probably about 600 in emergency shelter, probably about 250 in residential treatment. Uh, we also have prevention services where we hopefully help young moms who are pregnant and need an extra help to help that baby have a, a bright start. It's called the Bright Start Program. It's funded by the South Dakota Department of Health and United Way. And this is a program where nurses go out and help the mom have good prenatal care. And then they work with that child up till their age two or three, just on any sort of parenting issues, just to make sure that baby has a good, healthy, positive start in life. Hope we never have to come through the doors of the Children's Home Society. And our goal is for every child to have a loving family, to be in a home. Unfortunately, some of the kids can't be in their birth parents, but we have foster care and adoption programs for those children. And we also do home studies for relatives, oftentimes a grandparent. There was just something in the Argus Leader, a story about all the grandparents raising kids recently. It's, it's much more common today, um, uh, aunts and uncles. But we want to make sure it's a safe family, and we do those home studies. Uh, Children's Home Society has 360 staff, about... 100 of those are part-time, about 250 are full-time positions. Our budget annually is $16.6 .6 million. About 90% of that budget comes from some form of government funding, and about 10% of that budget comes through charitable giving, um, campaigns, gifts, events, uh, that type of thing. And I, I do want to say we appreciate the funding from the city, for, especially for the Children's Inn. That helps our domestic violence program at Children's Inn is funding we get from the city and the county are two definitely major partners um, over at the Children's Inn. So that's just an overview of kind of our history and our current programs. I'd like to tell you just a few examples, some cases, um, maybe to help you have a little better understanding of the kids. You know, some of the kids come, they're neglected. Uh, we had a boy that came, he was four years old, he weighed 28 pounds, knew about 15 words. Uh, we had a nine-year-old boy that came to our shelter he went on vacation with relatives, came home, and the mom was gone. No one knew where she was. Uh, we work with children as young as four and five years old, and they're put in a situation where they're responsible for younger siblings caring for them. Uh, many children have had emotional abuse of some sort. Um, we had one girl, the father would encourage her to run out in the, in the street and get hit by a car. This is an example. Uh, one boy came to our shelter, and the father had taken a permanent marker and wrote loser on his stomach. Um, some of the children have, have come to us, they've been locked in bedrooms, locked in basements, locked in closets, um, not allowed to eat or the bathroom. Um, one boy, as a punishment, he would, or one father, as a punishment, would put his young son in an oven and shut the door, kind of as a timeout punishment room, and it just terrified the boy. Um, we've had situations like a three-year-old girl who, who witnessed her mother beat her two-year-old brother to death. 
Um, we have cases of, of physical abuse. We had one child that was punished with a taser gun. Uh, we have a 15-month-old baby that came to us with a broken arm, broken legs, broken ribs, uh, burns on his arms. We had one girl that came, she had a rash on her legs, and after it was all treated, they found that it was caused by cigarette butt burns um, on her body. And then many children are victims of, of sexual abuse. Uh, we had a 12-year-old girl that was held down raped by her stepfather. A uh, brother and sister were forced into sexual activity. The dad took pictures and put them on the Internet. Uh, we had an 11-year-old boy that was sexually abused by two boys in the neighborhood and an 8-year-old girl that was sexually abused by her grandfather. And, you know, those stories especially I think are difficult to hear, but we really feel people need to hear these stories and realize that, you know, this doesn't happen you know, just in the bigger cities around the country. It happens in South Dakota, and we, we have our challenges here. About 2,500 children a year in the last few years are removed by their parents by the State Department of Social Services. Actually, that number's gone down a little bit. There's been a lot of good prevention services, a lot of good education programs. So amongst all that maybe sad and bad news, we do see hope. We do see things improving somewhat. We see a lot of great services to families. Uh, we see families being more open and accepting of help. And it's really interesting, you know, to work at a place like Children's Home, you know, unfortunately, you kind of see the worst of our society. But on the other hand, you see really the total opposite of that. We really see some incredible and wonderful things. We see children who are resilient. We see parents and families who accept help, want to get help, and they do get help. And they're able to have their children back home. And we see relatives and foster parents and adoptive parents who will take these kids in and, and give them new homes and a new, new opportunity. And the other thing we see is we see an incredible outpouring of support, volunteers, donors. They get involved. And there's, there's an incredible partnership among government, the for-profit business world, and the nonprofits in our community. And they really all want to help kids. They want to help families. And they want to make our world a better place. And they really do. You know, Children's Home, we're really proud of our 116-year history. And we're, we're committed to our mission. And we're really honored, really, to, to work with these partners and, and work with kids and help so many others who really want to help kids and help families and, and, and make a difference. And that's truly what our, our mission is really all about, making a difference for kids, making sure they're healthy, making sure they're safe, and, and breaking the cycle. So hopefully they'll, at some point, if they do have children, you, you break that cycle and their children will have, have safety and have love. And that's really what we're all about. Um, continuing that tradition of 16 years, 116 years. So that's just a quick overview, maybe a little longer than, than you had planned, but um, I really do appreciate the chance just to share. It's interesting, even though we've been around for years, a lot of people drive by, they really don't know, you know, what is Children's Home Society. We always invite anybody, if they're interested to learn more, give us a call, um, come take a tour and to learn more about what we have going on. I did bring a few of our annual reports, so I'll just let, leave them over at the table. It has some voter information, but also has some information and statistics about our programs and services, if anybody would be interested in having one of those. Uh, Councilor Knudsen. Mr. Weber, thank you so much for being with us today. Would you please remind uh, us and the listening audience of what phone number a person uh, could call and, and also what your website is, if in fact people are interested in volunteering at these wonderful facilities? Uh, uh, and or uh, possibly uh, investigating um, becoming a foster parent or even uh, adopting some of these uh, wonderful children. You bet. Thanks for asking because I, I should have mentioned that, that we're always looking for more volunteers, exactly like you say, foster parents, adoptive parents, volunteers. Our, our, our phone number to call is 605-334-6004, and our website is www.chssd.org. And there's two S's in there standing for Children's Home Society, South Dakota, is our website. Yep, thanks for asking that. Uh, Mr. Anderson. Um, I also want to thank you for coming and giving us the information that you have. Um, I was, I've lived in Sioux Falls all my life and never had any interaction with the society until just a couple of weeks ago when I went in for an interview. And after the interview, I was uh, lucky enough to get a tour of the facility. Um, it's just an amazing place and wonderful work you guys do. But I'd like you to explain uh, 
your fundraising policy and maybe uh, give us a little information about the, the latest one that you've just completed. Okay, you bet. We're really excited because we just started construction on our, our school. The school was built in 1987 for about 45 students. Today we have about 90. You know, it's like we grow and change. And we actually had a combined endowment campaign and a campaign to, to fund the school. The school project is uh, going to end up being about $2.3 million. We were fortunate that bids were actually lower than expected. Um, so it's going to end up being about a $2.3 million project. We're going to expand the classroom size, add classrooms, and we, of course, you have now, you have computers and you have occupational therapy and, and physical therapy, nursing. So we're expanding our school. We're going to double the size of our school. And, and we're very blessed that we just finished that campaign in addition to an endowment campaign. Um, we had a challenge gift from Denny Sanford of $14 million, and over the last three years, we earned that challenge. She gave it on a three-to-one challenge. So we raised $4.7 a third of the 14, because he gave us three dollars for every dollar. So we raised that endowment, and along with the, the the project for this for the school. One of our long-term goals is to build an endowment that will support 25 percent of our agency budget. We we know we'll always need government funding. Medicaid is big for us. We get federal, state, city, county, but we know we can't rely on that. And and our board has the vision to build an endowment that will support 25 percent of our annual budget through a through a distribution. And if I'm correct, you don't start any building until you have the money to pay for it. Is that correct? That's right. We have no debt at all. We don't have a penny of debt. And, and we plan for our needs well in advance. We have a long-range plan, and, and we will never start a building until we do have the money in hand. Uh, that's exactly right. Mr. Jameson. Rick, thanks for coming, and keep up the good work. What's the, uh, the name of the home in Rapid City? The Black Hills Children's Home is the facility that's similar to the Sioux Falls Children's Home where 52 children live in residential treatment. Then in, right in Rapid City proper, we have an emergency shelter in our community-based services, and it's called the Messengers Children's Center, and that's named for the Messengers of Healing Winds Foundation that Andrea Waite, it's, it's her private foundation, and they gave the lead gift for the emergency shelter in Rapid City. So again, the shelter is the Messengers Children's Center, and then out by Rockerville, really the bigger site is called the Black Hills Children's Home. Is there another home out there that has a name that we've heard of before? Uh, I think those are our only two sites in Rapid. What is the Owen home? Oh, the school. Oh, the yeah, school. the school. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Deborah Owen's uh, parents-in-law, Larry Owen, who, of course, now has passed away. Larry was on our board for many years, and Marilyn Owen is an honorary board member of the Children's Home Society. The school uh, facility at the Black Hills Children's Home is named in honor of Larry and Marilyn Owen. And, of course, Larry has a personal story of being adopted and um, longtime board member, longtime friends at Children's Home, very generous folks, helped us earn a lot of friends. And in their honor, we did name our school at the Black Hills Children's Home for the Owens. Ms. Benningham. Rick, I'm just curious, how many children, uh, after they're taken into your facility, have the opportunity to go back home? What percentage of, quote, success do you have in bringing them back to their original home? Yeah, I would say of the children that come into residential treatment, I would say about maybe 40% um, go back to their families. Now, some of those are referred by the school districts. And in that case, the parents agreed to the child to come. They signed off on the IEP, the Individual Education Plan. So the kids that are referred by the school districts, we work with the parents, and that's a part of the plan right away for the help the family, the child goes back home. Then we also work with families that the child protection services is involved with. And if those families can recognize their issues, deal with their issues, and work with the child protection and the court system and children's home, then they work to get their children back home too. So that does happen occasionally also. Uh, the majority of kids that come into residential, probably a little over 50%, aren't able to go back to their birth parents. They go to foster care and adoption. Thank you. Love to see you go out of business, but yeah. I know that will never happen. But you guys are doing an awesome job. I've had the opportunity to visit this one and the one in the hills, and it's just a remarkable uh, family environment. So thank you. Yep, thank you. Anything else for Rick? Well, Rick, I, I too would like to thank you for coming down here. And, uh, you know, even though you take us a little bit out of our comfort zone with some of the things that you said, I think that's necessary because uh, we have to be aware of the serious and grave nature of the business that you do conduct down there. And, and thank you for that. On a, on a little lighter thing, as I've been around this town long enough to remember that, that building on the hill over there, and Lewis Drug was on a hill back then. 
Uh, and I remember driving by looking at it out of the back seat of my dad's car and thinking it was a rather imposing structure. And it was called the orphanage back then. That was, that was the common name for it. Uh, but the good part about driving by there was there was a Zesto right on the corner, as I remember. And so thanks again for coming down. You bet. Okay. Thanks again for allowing me to come visit. Mm -hmm. Uh, the third item that we have is the YWCA Summer Food Service Program. We have Carla Johnson. She's the Director of Child Care Services down there. And Carla, thank you for coming down here today. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be invited here and tell you about a very important program we have for children in our city. Um, one site of which is just across the street over here at 11th and, and uh, Dakota Avenue at the YWCA's downtown location. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Summer Food Service Program, which is operated in that center. But before I do, I just want to tell you a little story, a little something that happened to me uh, the Friday before Memorial Day. It really made my week, it made my year, really, as a director. You know, every now and then we scratch our heads and wonder why we do what we do. And uh, I had one of those moments uh, happen during our feeding service program. Uh, we have children who walk in off the street to have their breakfast and have their lunches with us, and they go home, come back again the next day. Uh, I don't know if they are on foot. I don't know if they are on bicycle. I don't know how they get to us, but they do come through our front door every day for breakfast and for lunch. And after one week of having breakfast and lunch, this young little girl who's, I would say she's probably six or seven years old, had never spoken to me in, in the days prior to this, never spoken to me. Uh, she has her cherry of food. Uh, she'd finished eating, and she was putting it away. And she put it away and was about to go back to her table, push in her chair. And she came, she looked at me, and then she looked again, and then she came running to me and gave me the biggest hug, you know, mm -hmm. right about here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, thank you for such a nice hug. That's, that's, I really like that. She said, I want to write you a letter, but I don't write so good. <laughs> I said, well, I'd love to have a letter from you. I said, what would you write me? I would thank you for the good food every day. And let me tell you, that was an aha moment. Truly from the bottom of her heart, this was what she really needs. And she still comes every day. You'll see her every morning. You'll see her across the street at lunchtime as well. But this girl is not an isolated case. We have many, many children across the nation in the same, in the same kind of predicament, children who are actually going hungry if they didn't have this kind of a program. This summer, more families than ever are struggling with hunger due to our economic times. During the school year, many of these families have relied on school breakfast and lunch to provide their children with healthy meals um, to help them stretch their limited financial resources. Through the summer food service programs, programs can provide up to two healthy meals or snacks per day to children and teenagers age 18 years and younger at approved central sites and low-income areas. The meals are served free. There's no names asked. There's, there's nothing but a number that's recorded uh, so we can track the number of meals served. This, the SFSP program began as a pilot uh, back when Head Start began in 1968. And according to the USDA, is one of the most underutilized feeding programs uh, that we have in our nation. Although 18 million eligible children receive free or reduced price school meals during the school year, this was in fiscal year 07, only 1.9 million participated in the SFSP, and an additional 1.4 million participated in the National School Lunch Program during the summer months. Now that's only 3.3 million eligible children receiving meals during the summer months, which means we've got a lot of hungry kids out there. Sioux Falls, South Dakota, as I said, is no exception. I visited in preparation um, for this visit with you today, I, I called several folks uh, to get their input. And one such woman I visited with was, um, she's a sister. She's a nun, and uh, she works with children, or and not with children, but she's 
lives in the um, uh, apartments just across uh, from the fairgrounds on Lyons and 12th Street. She tells me that uh, there are 75 kids in that complex, age one year to 14 years, and 40 kids, age 14 to 18. Now, in, in my math, that's 115 kids that she says are hungry every day. That they come to her apartment, they're always asking her for food. Um, a lot of these kids, older brother or sister is babysitting, watching these kids. And this is a good example of these kids are kind of captured in their own island over there on Lyons and 12th Street. They have no way to get to places like ours for food. And so this would be a great opportunity if we could figure out some way to bring those children to a site to feed them. That's 115 kids a day, just in that one complex. And we know that's just a drop in the bucket. Uh, as one of the other calls I made was with, uh, to Sandra Kangris, who's the Director of Child and Adult Nutrition Services in Pier. Uh, she's the director of this federal program for the state of South Dakota. And uh, she indicated that in Sioux Falls, we have the following sites provo providing meals. Uh, the YWCA, which uh, started the meal program the day after school was out on May 18th, and will provide that program through August 21st, which is uh, beyond when the Sioux Falls School District goes uh, to school, but Harrisburg uh, starts a little later than Sioux Falls. So we're continuing ours until the 21st of August. The Sioux Falls School Districts operate uh, programs at Edison Middle School, at Hawthorne and Hayward, Terry Redland, and Laura B. Anderson. Youth Enrichment Services provides a breakfast and lunch, and Volunteers of America, America Dakotas, I believe at the Bowdoin Center, provides a supper, meal, and a snack. And actually, the Bowdoin kids uh, walk to our place just a couple blocks down the street for breakfast. They walk back to their center for their activities. They walk back to our place for lunch, and then they walk back for their, they come, they have their snack at their place and their supper as well. Uh, last summer, according to uh, Child and Adult Nutrition and Peer, a total of 18,894 meals were served. And the YWCA, I can't speak for the rest of the organizations, but we have seen an overall increase of 11% uh, in the number of breakfasts that we're serving uh, just in the short time uh, that we've been on, in operation this year, and an overall 4% increase in the number of lunches served. Though uh, we had a slow start, uh, we've gradually picked up steam, and at this point in time, we are about 16% uh, increase over our last year figure for lunches. The school year provided me some data as well. Excuse me, the school district provided me some data as well. Um, in October of last year, 5,335 kids were eligible for free, free meals. That number grew about 8% by the end of the school year to 5,808 students. Uh, for reduced priced eligibility, the school district had 1,632 uh, qualifying for reduced meals. And that dropped slightly, 3.5% uh, to 1,576. The assumption may be made that some of the folks who were uh, qualifying for reduced price meals at the beginning of the school year qualified for free meals probably by the end of the school year, but there is no way of tracking that data for you. Uh, in summary, I guess what I'd like to say is we've got a great thing, another great thing going here for our kids in Sioux Falls, South Dakota through these summer programs, these summer feeding program sites. And uh, uh, it is a, a pleasure to provide this kind of information to you. And I would really encourage you, you know, we're just an arm's throw away. Come on over and join us for lunch. Hmm. Uh, we would love to have you see this program in action. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, Carla, thanks also for being with us today. Um, what, what hours do you uh, serve breakfast and lunch, and um, also um, how do you advertise this, this program? Well, um, our hours are breakfasts are served from 8 to 9 in the morning, and lunch is served from 11 until 1, uh, Monday through Friday. We have one day off, and that is the Friday before uh, the 4th of July. So we close the 3rd of July. Other than that, it's a Monday through Friday program. 
uh, during those hours. And what do we do to advertise? Well, uh, we have posters out, and uh, we put the word out through uh, other nonprofits, and we have some flyers out, and uh, that's we don't have a lot of money to do any uh, of the of the good stuff, uh, but. Uh, uh, it's really a, a lot of word of mouth. Where I tell you, it's, you can tell on Mondays people have been talking about it over the weekend because on Mondays we'll have new faces, new families walking through the front door. And we have a child care center. We're feeding, of course, children over at our child care center. But we have many families who walk in and uh, have their, their lunch. The meals are not provided to adults, but they are provided to children age 18 and younger. Mr. Anderson. Oh, Joe. Thank you. Um, Carla, thanks for being here and the work that you do. Uh, do you know if there's any way for you or your organization to track, or is there a way to track, the children who might or do use the fixed route bus system to come to your uh, feeding locations, and if that's an opportunity for the city to be a stronger partner? I believe we would be able to track that. Uh, be an easily uh, just a little tick sheet that we could we could take for our walk-ins when they come in. You know we're very very convenient. Uh, we have a bus stop for all the inbound buses right across the street over here on uh, 11th. Uh, for the outbound, for those coming on the east side of town, we have a bus stop just a block away over here on Dakota Avenue. So very convenient walking less than a block for everyone who would like to participate. Uh, taking the bus. In particular, I'm thinking of those 12th and Lions kids. There's a bus stop, I believe. Uh, Two very, blocks away. It's very, very close. And if we have 115 kids there, wow, what an impact that could make for those kids. Yeah, I, I think if there's a way for the city to uh, enhance the communications and to find these young people who need that extra support. There's no extra cost for the city to operate that fixed route bus that's going to drive by there anyhow. Right. So if there's an opportunity to enhance your program and feed more children, I think that that's something that the city ought to be participating with. We appreciate that. Uh, to expand on that, uh, thank you, Gerald, for that point. Uh, last Friday, um, I had the opportunity to take Karen Walton down to the YWACA and have her experience the lunch program that they have down there. And uh, I think to that end, we are starting to work together to see what we can do about uh, providing that transportation for those children. Uh, the other thing that I was also looking for out of this, and that's the reason why I had the food bank also here the other week, is that during the school year, we have a backpack program. And that was a program that I thought also could be extended through the summer through these eight facilities here, and if they even expand to another one, as we've been discussing, uh, might be a good opportunity to expand that backpack program and find these youth that are at risk of not being able to have something over the weekend also, and it not costing a great deal of money, but except for just putting together the, the program to try to you know, provide services for these youth. Very good. Uh, Councillor Brown. The city does have a bus pass program. I know that only through the Homeless Advisory Board because Stacy Teason, our city county employee, coordinates that. And I know for a while there were 60,000 passes being distributed. They weren't all getting used, so that got reduced, I believe, to 40,000. But we could check with her and see because the school district also receives passes for families and children to use. So maybe we should check into that program and see where those passes past numbers are. We would appreciate any help on this. Um, Stacy was a name that was brought up. Also the lady in Pier would like to try to get these people together maybe into a meeting and try to cut form, format a plan to service these children. Councillor Knudsen. Carl, I was just thinking um, about that apartment building that you mentioned with all of those very hungry children and again I realize that that is not unfortunately not the only apartment building in our great city that is full of hungry children. But I was just wondering, just, you know, I was wondering if um, the YWCA um, might ever be able to, to do any kind of a satellite program at, at that particular apartment building with, of course, the permission of the owner, like in their community room and maybe some mm -hmm. business partners 
and then also thinking about that, those same children, I was, I was wondering, I don't remember if the Hayward um, Community Center, if they offer a summer um, um, food program for children, but that's at least in that general area, though I realize it's further, it's, further Hayward away. Hayward does have a program. Okay. Uh, it would be probably, a, what, two miles yeah, uh, that's quite for, a for them to walk for them. Or, or get to. Great question, great comment. And uh, believe it or not, that, that was an option I discussed with uh, Sister. Unfortunately, she has one room. It's 12 foot by 12 foot. Mm -hmm. um, the, the state has certain requirements we have to have, running water, toilet facilities, uh, access to garbage service. Of course, that wouldn't be a problem, but we run into a few issues um, in in that realm and uh, we even discussed the possibility of running such a program uh, out of a garage again we'd have to make sure probably make some kind of accommodations for run, hot and cold running water that kind of thing but that's definitely an option that 115 children is a tremendous amount of children in one spot um, and again that's just one complex Mr. Steggers. Yes, uh, Carla, the uh, funding for your program, is that pretty much exclusively federal funding? Yes, yes it is. It's mm -hmm. passed through dollars to the federal government, onto state government, mm -hmm. and then state government to the agencies, or the okay. sponsors of the program. Do you receive any commodities from the Department of Agriculture? Uh, for this program, just a few. Just yes. a few, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> Um, D, just to expand on what you were thinking too, uh, Carla and I have discussed a couple other areas that we thought uh, could also be very useful in their areas. Uh, the Woodier neighborhood on the west side of Cliff Avenue was a uh, location we've been looking at, and then the Garfield School, which would be very close to those children on West 12th Street, is one that I thought was on this list but is not. So those would be areas that as we move forward that we're going to try to to see if we can get cooperation from those entities. It, I was just thinking too, um, would there be any church uh, that's in that locality that that would, um, I don't know if, the, you know, I realize there's a separation of church and state kind of thing and issues sometimes, but I was wondering if, if, if there were if that would be a possibility too. We're looking for ideals and and if there's anyone out there that uh, has a location, please give, please give, send me an email or give me a call. Um, I guess the last thing, Carla, do you have a website or a contact phone number that someone, if they had any questions for you? Definitely. Uh, I can be reached at my office at uh, area code 605-362-9438. And our website at the YWCA is www.ywca-sf. Dot org. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to provide this information to you. Again, I would like to invite you to come and visit us at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you for coming down here. Very good. Well, that, uh, that concludes our presentations. Uh, next on the thing, item number 10 is an executive session, and I will need a motion to adjourn into executive session for personnel matter. Mr. Castell. 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 Before we vote, if I, or do that, I, uh, I see Gail's in the audience. I assume she's here for a reason to visit with this. Is there anything you wanted to talk about? No, I don't think Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> nope. Counselor. Mr. Brown. Let's I should have done this in open uh, discussion. Uh, I just want, I share, wanted to share an email I got from Ms. Elizabeth Whaley at the zoo. They had their summer event, the Zippity Zoo Days, and their attendance was 57% over last year's attendance. More than 4,000 people went through the zoo on Saturday, and they doubled the number of memberships sold on that day as well. So good day for the zoo. Good day for Elizabeth. Very good. Anything else? Well, I, uh, I still need a motion to adjourn into the executive session for a personnel matter. I so move Knudsen. Knudsen moves. Second, second Anderson. And Mr. Anderson seconds. Okay, we uh, will adjourn into executive session. We'll meet in here and back in here in three minutes. We need to vote on that.
Pardon me? We need to take the vote on that. We do? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same side. That's what I thought. Very good. Three minutes. 503 will reconvene. Um,